Om Jnana Timurandasya Jnana Shalakaya Chaksur Militanyena Tesma Shri Gurave Namaha Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patitanam Pavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar, Shri Vasade Gaur Bhaktavinda. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So welcome everyone uh, to our continuing study here, Bhakti Vaibhav, the second part of the Bhakti Vaibhav where you're studying Canto 4 up to Canto 6. And we're on Canto 6 here, and this is Chapter 7. We're beginning to this evening here. Chapter 7, entitled, Indra Offends His Spiritual Master, Brihaspati. So we can see without much difficulty what is the connection between these two chapters the previous chapter 6 and chapter 7, the chapter 6 finished with a description how uh, the Brahmana Tvashta gave birth, he, had, he fathered two sons in the womb of a woman who was from the family of the demons. And one of the sons was Tvashta, uh, rather Vishwarup. Trashta was the father, Vishwarup was the, one of the sons. And uh, this Vishwarup went on to become the guru of the demigods. So it was mentioned how he became the guru of the demigods. It said that the, somehow the, the guru of the demigods, namely Brihaspati, he had abandoned the demigods because the demigods had disrespected him. So the chapter 7 begins like that. We're going to hear Maharaj Parikshit begins by questioning here, and I'm sharing the screen here so you can see the text. <laughs> Maharaj Parikshit inquired from Shukadeva Goswami, O oh, great sage, what did the spiritual master of the demigods, Brihaspati, do? Uh, that he was reject that he rejected the demigods who were his own disciples. What offence did the demigods commit against their spiritual master? Please describe to me this incident. Certainly very important. We want to understand exactly what we should be doing and what we should be careful not to do when we're dealing with the spiritual master. Connection with the spiritual master. You know, the disciples, we often like to get close to our guru, but at the same time, Srila Prabhupada used to tell us, he said, don't get too close, don't get too far away. So like that, this is a, a this is a, the principle in dealing with the spiritual master. Don't get too close. Why? You get too close, you mis we will misunderstand and we'll think of the spiritual master to be like an ordinary person. And then we become offensive. And we get too far away, then we don't take the instructions seriously. We're not valuing the importance of hearing from the spiritual master. So like this, we, we have to understand, uh, we don't want to be offensive. We want to be very cautious in dealing with the spiritual master. Mm. So Prabhupada quotes in the purport, he quotes Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. He says, this seventh chapter describes how Brihaspati was offended by the demigods. How he left them? and the demigods were defeated, and how the demigods followed the instructions of Lord Brahma, accepted Vishwarup as a priest, 
to perform their sacrifice. So, Sukadeva Goswami begins his reply, there are many verses there together, and Sukadeva Goswami is describing the situation in the palace of Indra. How Indra, the king of heaven, is sitting there surrounded by all the different demigods and even great saintly persons are all there and he's being worshipped, they're fanning him and they're all re offering respects and doing different services. The Apsaras and Gandharvas are singing and dancing with sweet musical instruments and there's the white umbrella symbolizing that Indra is a king and he is a, the whole the, the umbrella is as fulgent as effulgent as a full moon. So the peacock fans are going and the, the yak tails, the chamaras are being used. And Indra is sitting there with his wife together on the throne and it's at this time that Brihaspati comes in the assembly. And Brihaspati is the best, he is a, a great sage. He's, he's the, the guru of Indra and the demigods and he's being, he's meant to be respected He's, he, he is actually respected both by the demigods and the demons, even the demons, although he's not the guru of the demons, but they respect him because they know his spiritual position. So although Indra saw his spiritual master before him, he did not rise from his own seat to offer a seat to his spiritual master nor did Indra offer him a respectful welcome. Indra did nothing to show his respect. So, what was the cause? Why did Indra not show res respect to Brihaspati? What is the reason someone can tell me? What, what, what caused Indra to not offer respects to his own spiritual master? Yes, Prabhu, you have your hand up. Who is it? What, what's her name? Padba. So, huh? Yes, Prabhu, who had, the, who had their hand up? They put their hand down, is it? <laughs> Sundar Govinda Prabhu, Govinda Dev Prabhu, you can tell me what you think. Oh, all right, Pada Seva Prabhu, you have your hand up. What was the cause? Pada Seva, can hear you. Oh, very difficult to hear you. Can you hear what he said, Prabhu? Anyone? Where are you? Which part of the globe are you in? I cannot hear a word you say, Prabhu. Oh. What about, we ask Mataji, the ladies are usually more intelligent, right? What about this Madhavi, Harishwari Madhavi, Mataji? Uh, because he was very proud 
Opulence. Opulence, right. Proud of his opulence. That's right. The opulence. Of course. I mean, we, we have to be sympathetic. <laughs> he was in the heavenly planets. He was really opulent. You know, we have a little opulence here on this planet. It's nothing compared to the heavenly planets. And look at the situation Indra was in. Surrounded by so many demigods and the, and the Apsaras and the Gandharvas. And they're all worshipping him, they're glorifying him. And then his spiritual master comes in. Well, it was a real test of his humility, and he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't immediately respond. He didn't offer any respect. Can you think of another situation where a similar thing happened, where somebody did not offer respects to the, to the, to the, the spiritual authority? As far as I remember Indra, when he was forgetting to offer respect to Brihaspati. Indra forgot to offer respects to who? Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Brihaspati, oh, this is what we are talking right now, right? Yeah, we're talking about Indra here. But I was thinking, there's another example. I was thinking... Maharaj. Huh? Maharaj, Bali Maharaj. Bali Maharaj, what did he do? Bali Maharaj was respectful. But he rejected his spiritual master when he was instructed. <laughs> well, that, so, yeah, he rejected the instruction of a spiritual master, but he did not directly disrespect his spiritual, he just did not follow the instruction because of the contradiction. But I was thinking of Lord Balaram coming in Naimisharanya. And Romaharsha and Sutta is there. And everyone was re respecting Lord Balaram. Everyone got up or folded their hands or bowed down. Everyone except Romaharsha and Sutta. Because Romaharsha and Sutta was, he was the, the speaker and he was sitting on the elevated seat. And Lord Balaram came into the assembly. And Romaharsha and Sutta didn't offer any respects to him. So Lord Balaram took it very seriously. So seriously that he decided to remove Romaharsha and Sutta. Anyway, here you have Indra. And we, should, we can also think how material opulence in our own way of life, in our own living, how it can also affect us. Have, do you, have you had any kind of similar experience where you were affected, where you, or where you saw others, or where you yourself were influenced by material opulence? How it caused you to uh, not give proper respect to spiritual authorities? Yeah, anyone? You're not troubled by material opulence, huh? it doesn't bother you, it doesn't go to your head. If you happen to be riding in your Mercedes Benz and your spiritual master comes walking by. Yeah, this is not my problem, no. I don't have a Mercedes. Maybe unfortunately. Mm. Certainly, material opulence can go to our heads in the modern times, what to speak, in the heavenly planets. We become proud. And even the poor man is proud of a little wealth. Pride is a big problem. 
And that's why we have to cultivate austerity. One of the principles of religion is austerity. But austerity is destroyed by intoxication. And pride is another kind of intoxication. We become intoxicated due to wealth, due to fame, due to position in society. It's a very dangerous thing. So we have to be very cautious about these things, how you deal with wealth and how you uh, receive wealth and how you receive honor and respect. We have to be always ready to offer respects to others and not to be eager to be honored and respected by others, but rather we have to be eager to offer respect to others. Uh, the, we can see Lord Shiva had a problem with Daksha because Lord Shiva, he didn't get up to offer respects to Daksha. But Lord Shiva, he wasn't required to offer his respects to Daksha because Lord Shiva was in a superior position to Daksha. Lord Shiva is the... He's the... Uh, Guna Avatar, he is the expansion of the Lord. But Daksha, he is a Jiva. Although he was a Prajapati, and although Lord Shiva was married to his daughter Sati, he was, a, you know, he was like, Lord Shiva was like the son in law, and so he was meant to respect his father in law. But Lord Shiva is always meditating on the Supreme Lord. So if one is always meditating on the Supreme Lord, if one's mind is always fixed on the Supreme Lord, then you're not required to offer respects to others because you're already offering respect to the Lord. But that, that was a special position of Lord Shiva. Generally, we're not always thinking of the Lord and we do have to offer respects to others. And particularly, we have to offer respect to the spiritual master and to the brahmanas and to the spiritual seniors. It's an important part of Vaishnava etiquette. And Prabhupada would notice, Prabhupada would look and watch to see, are the devotees respecting? Are they bowing down? Okay, let's go ahead. Text number nine. Brehaspati knew everything that would happen in the future. Seeing Indra's transgression of etiquette, he completely understood that Indra was puffed up by his material opulence. Although able to curse Indra, he did not do so. Instead, he left the assembly and in silence returned to his home. Brihaspati didn't curse them because he knew they're going to get the reactions on their own. The reactions will come because of their own behavior. He didn't need to curse them. But we, we see the, that the problem was Indra was proud. He was puffed up because of his material opulence. And the same situation was there with, with Daksha in relation to Lord Shiva in the fourth canto. You remember when you studied the Daksha Yagya, how Daksha was envious of Lord Shiva. Because Lord Shiva, Lord Shiva's on the, the level with even above Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva is almost like God and he was respected by everyone and Daksha didn't like it that this man is, is getting more respect than me. So some envy was there. 
Anyway, here Indra is just simply affected, intoxicated by his position, by the opulence, by the surroundings. In the Bhagavad Gita, what does Lord Krishna say about material opulence? Who knows the verse in the Bhagavad Gita? Yes, go ahead. Vaya Vasayat Mika Buddhi. Samadona Buddhi. What's the translation? Can somebody help him? Who knows the translation for this verse? He who is a affected by the material opulence and enjoyment, he cannot be fixed in Krishna consciousness. Yeah. In the minds of those who are attached to material opulence and sense gratification, and who are bewildered by such things, then the resolute determination for devotional service does, does not take place. And so there in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna is warn, warning us about the dangers of material opulence. It, you know, we don't say you cannot have opulence, but don't be bewildered by it. Don't become proud of it. And don't become, don't think that because you have some opulence, so you don't have to follow the etiquette. You don't have to respect the seniors. So that, that's a danger that we become influenced by material opulence, it goes to our head. And even a little position, a little opulence can go to our head. We have to be very careful. Prabhupada told the story, there was one devotee in Los Angeles. So he was a, one of the big managers there in the Los Angeles temple. And Prabhupada told the story, he said, he said, this whole material creation is one-fourth compared to the spiritual world. And in this whole material creation, there's an infinite number of universes. And in this infinite number of universes, there's one universe, which we are in, where there's an infinite number of planets. And there's one tiny planet in this universe called Earth. And in this one tiny planet called Earth, there's one country called USA. And in this one country called USA, there are many cities. And there's one city called Los Angeles. And in this one city, Los Angeles, there's many, many streets. And there's one street called Watsika Avenue. And on this Watsika Avenue, there are many, many homes, many houses, there's many buildings. And there's one building, which is our ISKCON center. And in our ISKCON center, there are many, many devotees. But this one devotee thinks he is controlling the whole creation. He is the center of the whole universe. So Prabhupada was describing how insignificant we are. What is our position in this world? How we're very insignificant. We're nobody. But still, if we get a little position or a little power, it can go to our head. We have to be very careful. So Indra got a problem. However, after Brihaspati left, text number 10 continues, Indra, the king of heaven, could immediately understand his mistake. Realizing he had disrespected his spiritual master, he condemned himself in the presence of all the members of the assembly. Now, you have to understand Indra is an exalted, it's a position. It's a position given to a living entity to be the king of heaven. And in order to take that position, it's a very big responsibility. And you have to, the king of heaven, you're responsible for maintaining the order in the universe. 
So in order to take that position, you have to have a lot of pious activities to your credit. To, to have these kind of pious activities is necessary before you could ever sit on the throne of the King of Heaven. So, try to understand Indra is not just some lusty guy or some lusty person who somehow he got into heaven and he became the king. But try to understand he had many pious, he has many pious activities to his credit. And when the spirit, when Brihaspati left the scene, then Indra felt guilty and he began to repent. Now this repentance, that is a good sign. That is, you know, as devotees, often sometimes we will do something wrong, we make some mistakes, and we will feel guilty about it. That, that, that we should do, we should feel guilt, we should have some mood of repentance, that I did wrong, I shouldn't have done like that. And we should think how we can make up for it, how we can improve on the situation. So this is the situation, uh, Indra's repentant and he's thinking what, what to do, oh my, the Guru's gone, Brihaspati's gone. And he's admitting his fault in the presence of the assembly of all the demigods. So text number 11 says, Oh, what a regrettable deed I have committed because of my lack of intelligence and my pride in my material opulences. I failed to show respect to my spiritual master when he entered the assembly, and thus I have insulted him. Oh, now that is serious. We know that is the first offence in chanting the holy name, to blaspheme the devotees who have dedicated their lives and propagating. And Prabhupada said, or the Vaishnava Acharyas tell us that first, the first offence, that is the Hati Mata offence, the mad elephant offence. The mad elephant offence, because it can destroy the whole creeper of devotion. So very serious, we have to be very careful not to commit such an offence. So text number 12 continues, Indra is reflecting on his situation, he said, Although I am king of the demigods, who am situated in the mode of goodness, I was proud of a little opulence and polluted by false ego. Under the circumstances, who in this world would accept such riches at the risk of falling down? Alas, I condemn my wealth and opulence. So Indra is describing his, his realization that, that I made them a great mistake by accepting this position that I'm supposed to be situated in the mode of goodness. But I became proud. I was given so much opulence and it has polluted my heart. The false ego, the ahankar, which is there within us, covers the soul. And this causes, <clears throat> this causes fall down. So Indra is condemning his wealth and opulence. And of course the, this kind of realization comes to many people. Many times people who are given a lot of wealth, they, they find that so many problems come. That it breaks the family up, the family all become affected by the wealth and opulence. They don't have the same love and feelings for each other. It's a very dangerous thing. Therefore, Lord Ch Prabhupada's in the purport, he's quoting Lord Chaitanya Shikshastikam, 
Natanam Nachanam Nasundarim. That I don't want wealth. I don't want followers. I don't want to be praised by others, especially the, the fair sex. I don't want any of these things. I don't even want liberation. I simply want devotional service, birth after birth. So this is Lord Chaitanya's prayer. And, it, and it, it, it's a warning, it's an instruction to us. We want to chant the holy name with feeling. We, we should not be influenced, we should not be affected by material opulence. Queen Kunti's prayer is also there. Janma Aishwarya Shruta Shribir Edamana Madapuma Naivahati Avidatam Vai Twam Akinchana Gocharam That those who are on the path of material progress and what is material progress? That Janma, oh I want to be bo I want to be in the, the good birth, the aristocratic family and Aishwarya opulence, wealth, and shruta, uh, learning, education, and shri, bodily beauty. These things are so important to people in the material path. So if you're on the path of material progress, you're trying to improve yourself in these things, then Krishna or Queen Kunti said, you won't know Krishna. It will be very difficult for you to come to know Krishna because Krishna is akinchana gochara. Krishna becomes the property of those who are materially impoverished or those who are not interested in material opulence. We don't say you have to give them up, but don't be proud of them. Don't let it go to your head. Don't think you're better than others because you've got some wealth. We have to see the Lord in the heart of all living entities. So Prabhupada in this purport, he writes about the situation in the Western world. You can see in this purport of text number 12, he said, we are, now see, we are now actually seeing this in America. Oh, 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 what, what are we seeing? The demigods are situated in the mode of goodness, but sometimes even one who is situated in such an exalted position as King Indra, the king of the demigod, falls down because of material opulence. We are now seeing this in America. The entire American nation has need to advance in material opulence without striving to produce ideal human beings. It had tried to advance in material opulence, but it didn't give importance to the character, to the culture of the people. And this is a problem everywhere in the world today, not just in America. We see everywhere in the world that this problem is there. And the result is that Americans are now regretting the wholesale criminality of American society and are wondering how and, and are wondering how America has uh, how America has become so lawless and unmanageable. Yeah, the situation in American cities is very difficult. There's no safety, there's no security. At any time people can be shot or murdered or robbed, women can be raped. So many dangers are there, the, 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 the social security, the, the, the situation there in America and, and not only just in America, it's there 
in many other countries also. And what is the cause? We give so much importance to material, economic advancement, but we don't think about the culture and the proper education of people, giving them proper spiritual knowledge. All right? So it's a very important purport there, text number 12. Uh, Prabhupada writes, uh, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, na te vidu swarga gatim hi vishnam. Persons who are unenlightened do not know the aim of life, which is to return home back to Godhead. Therefore, both individually and collectively, they try to enjoy so-called material comforts and they become addicted to wine and women. The men produced in such a society are less than fourth class. They are the unwanted population known as Varna Sankara. And as stated in Bhagavad Gita, an increase of Varna Sankara population creates a hellish society. This is a society in which Americans now find themselves. So this was the situation. Prabhupada, of course, wrote this sixth canto, must have been like mid-1970s. Mid-19, about 50 years ago. How much the situation has deteriorated. We cannot say it has improved. Uh, rather, what was in America then is all over the world today, all around the world. Whatever things, you know, the technology comes up and it spreads. And the same way, the culture, the habits, is all spreading around the world. But Prabhupada writes, what, what, is, the what is the hope in this situation? He said, Prabhupada said, fortunately, however, the Hare Krishna movement has come to America. And many fortunate young men are giving serious attention to this movement. Fortunate young men. At least in Prabhupada's time, there were many fortunate young men. I don't know how the situation is in the USA today. I don't know how much young men are coming to the Krishna consciousness movement. I'm, I don't know. But certainly we're always attempting to try to distribute Krishna consciousness more and more. And the young people, they're important, very important. In Prabhupada's time, Prabhupada was asked, he said, why is it your movement attracts so many young people? Because in Prabhupada's time, all the devotees were young. I was in my 20s. And most, most, nearly all the devotees were 20s and some were in 30s. If you were in 30s, you were older. So sometimes reporters would ask Prabhupada, how is it your movement attracts so many young people? And Prabhupada would explain to them, he would say, because that is the time for education. That is the time people need to get education. You go, you go to universities, you go to college, you see young people. So similarly, our movement is meant to give people education, to get that kind of culture, to get that knowledge which is not given in any other place which is so much lacking in the society today. So we try to fulfill that need by distributing Krishna consciousness. Okay, did you have your hand up, Prabhu? Is that a question? Prabhu, actually, uh, whether I am correct or wrong, uh, you were uh, 20 years uh, in the days of Srila Prabhupada? Yes. What did you say? You, you were 20 years uh, old uh, uh, during the days of Srila Prabhupada? Yes. Okay. You joined where in the movement of Srila Prabhupada? I joined in London. London, okay. 1971. 
I was initiated. 1971. So by, by 1971, you were only 20 years old? No, 1971 is 22. 22, okay. <laughs> well, let's thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah? Any other comments or questions? Devadhi Maharaj, it is very interesting to know that you joined uh, so early in devotional life. It is very intriguing and... Uh, <laughs> well, I remember when I joined, I thought, oh, I wish I'd known about Krishna consciousness earlier. I could have joined earlier. I was regretting that I had not joined earlier. That was my re what was in my mind when I joined. I thought, if only I had come to Krishna's consciousness before. I thought, I'm already 22. Actually, when I joined, most of the devotees, the other devotees, they were teenagers. <laughs> some, some others were in their 20s, but not, there were, we were not too many. We were a small number in those days. But we were a very, very spiritual society. We lived in a very frugal manner and we all lived together and we all worked together and our whole focus was Krishna consciousness. The whole day was spent in Krishna consciousness from the morning to the evening. Every day we had Harinam Sankirtan in the streets of London. And morning and evening we were studying Srila Prabhupada's books. All right, so we're hearing uh, about Indra's plight. And he's regretting how he accepted the throne and became offensive to his guru. So Indra continues, text number 13, he said, If a person says, one who is situated on the exalted throne of a king should not stand up to show respect to another king or a brahmana, it is, it is to be understood that he does not know the superior religious principle. Uh. All right, so Indra is making a point that if you don't show respect to others, then it, it means you don't you don't know the religious principles. And this is something which, of course, we try to, we try to educate people in, in Krishna consciousness. When we come to Krishna consciousness, we're taught these things. We're taught, oh, we, we come into the temple room, we bow down before the deities. And we, bow, we offer worship to the spiritual master, to Srila Prabhupada every day in the temple room. We do Prabhupada Guru Puja and we bow down to him. We, we were taught when Prabhupada comes, we would bow down to him. So Indra is making the point that If just because you're sitting on a big throne, on a big seat, if you don't get up to show respect to people, then it means you don't know the religious principles. I gave the example, Romaharshan Sutta, was at fault. The example of Lord Shiva not offering respect was a special case because Lord Shiva is transcendentally situated. He's the supreme, he's the topmost Vaishnava. 
so he was not required to offer respect. But Daksha was accusing him of being offensive. And Daksha said he's uncultured. But it was actually Daksha who didn't know the real culture. All right, so this is an, import, an important point here. Showing respects to the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. We see Lord Krishna, when Sudama came to visit Lord Krishna in Dwarka, then Lord Krishna got up. And he worshipped Sudama, and he washed the feet of Sudama. And then he fed Sudama, and he massaged his feet. Lord Krishna showed us how to respect the Brahmanas. And then uh, we see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as a sannyasi traveling different places. People would invite him to come to their homes to take food. When he was in Kurmakshetra, he met the Brahmana and the Brahmana brought him to his home and fed him and worshipped him. And then of course the Brahmana wanted to go with Lord Chaitanya, but Lord Chaitanya told him, no, no, he said, you stay here. He said, just be Krishna conscious, tell people about Krishna. So culture was there. Srila Prabhupada never demanded that we worship, just like at one point the devotees started to wash the feet of Srila Prabhupada. When he arrived at the place, the devotees brought water and everything and they bathed his lotus feet. So Srila Prabhupada had not told them to do that, but when they, did, when they wanted to do it, Prabhupada accepted it. And Prabhupada said, oh, now you are learning. Prabhupada appreciated that now they were learning. But of course, washing the feet, washing the lotus feet of someone, that is something which is, you, you have to be very sensitive about where you are and what kind of country you're in. Because some parts of the world, this will be condemned, very much condemned. You have to be very careful. If you go to countries like maybe in India or Bangladesh, it's not such a big thing because people are familiar with that. But outside of these two countries, then it's a bit difficult because people are not familiar with it. Uh, all right, so uh, we're hearing about the 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 importance of culture in the society. Prabhupada writes in the purport here, a civilization in which the people do not know how the society should be formed and how one should advance in Krishna consciousness. In other words, a society concerned only with manufacturing new cars and new skyscrapers every year and then breaking them to pieces and making new ones may be technologically advanced, but is not a human civilization. A human civilization is advanced when its people follow the, Varn the Chatur Varna system, the system of four orders of life. And so Prabhupada is explaining uh, about this important point here that <laughs> we have to understand what is going on in the world today. This is very much Prabhupada's mood and mission. You can see Prabhupada's uh, making this very clear point, you know, that building new cars and skyscrapers yeah, it's so important to people, it goes on around the world, everywhere, skyscraper buildings, oh, you know, more and more. It's not like it's come to, you, 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 in America, of course, they have their skyscraper buildings already built, but 
in the, over the years, I, I'm, I'm mostly preaching in Asian countries, and I see more and more building, uh, they're constructing more and more skyscraper buildings, and more and more cars, the, the different cars which come. And, oh, the, and they're thinking, this is advancement. And of course, the cars are more and more expensive, they cost more and more money, people have more and more money, and this, this is how they spend their money. Motor cars, skyscraper buildings. Are the people happier? No. We cannot say that the people are happier. Rather, the stress is greater than ever before. And the criminality is greater. There's more and more crime. You build cars and people will steal the cars. You've got a class of people who are always there waiting to steal the new car, break the car and steal it. The skyscraper buildings, people are jumping out of the windows of the skyscraper buildings because they're so bewildered, they're so depressed, they're so disappointed with the modern lifestyle. So, building the skyscraper building, it didn't help people to come, to come any closer to Krishna. It simply took them further away from the goal of life. Okay, we'll go ahead. We have to... I don't want to get caught up too much in... Text 14. Leaders who have fallen into ignorance, who mislead people by directing them to the path of destruction, as described in the previous verse, are in effect boarding a stone boat. So this example is given here, a stone boat. And so too are those who blindly follow them. A stone boat would be unable to float and would sink in the water with its passengers. Similarly, those who mislead people go to hell and their followers go with them. Wow, very powerful statements here. Indra, in, King Indra is speaking about what's happening. You see, the leaders, if, the, if, if we don't have proper leaders to guide the society, then we get these kind of problems. Right? Prabhupada writes in the purport here again about the American society. I've marked it, you can see on the screen through the purport here, uh, text 14. Thus one will board a boat of stone which will sink and drown all of its passengers. Unfortunately, although the American people are extremely eager to get out of materialistic chaos, they are sometimes found to patronize the makers of stone boats. That will not help them. They must take the proper boat offered by Krishna in the form of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. Then they will be easily saved. In this regard, Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, if society is guided by political diplomacy with one nation maneuvering against another, it will certainly sink like a stone boat. Political maneuvering and diplomacy will not save human society. People must take Krishna consciousness to understand the aim of life, to understand God and to fulfill the human mission. And so the stone boat, <laughs> certainly you don't want to, you won't go far, you won't be able to cruise on a stone boat. So again, this is Prabhupada's mood and mission. Prabhupada is trying to save us from these things. Society, which is just simply concerned with politics and diplomacy, then they're missing the goal of life.
We're just simply trying to enforce our power. We want to be powerful over other nations. And we're not thinking about the condition of our own nation, just simply by force, by weapons. We want to be powerful over others. We'll just read one more text and then we'll take a break. All right, text number 15. King Indra said, Therefore, with great frankness and without duplicity, I shall now bow my head to the lotus feet of Brihaspati, the spiritual master of the demigods, because he is in the mode of goodness. He is fully aware of all knowledge and is the best of the brahmanas. Now I shall touch the lotus feet and offer my obeisances unto him to try to satisfy him. So Indra has become very repentant. The problem is it's too late. <laughs> it's too late. The damage is already done. And Brihaspati is gone. So Prabhupada's purport quotes Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur, uh, Guru Vasikam, the final verse, by the mercy of the spiritual master, one gets the mercy of Krishna. But without the mercy of the spiritual master, then there's simply havoc in the path of self-realization. So Prabhupada writes, and you can see I've highlighted it, a disciple should never be a hypocrite or be unfaithful to his spiritual master. Very important in dealing with the spiritual master. We must be straightforward. Don't be a hypocrite. Hypocrite. They say one thing is you're doing another. Don't be unfaithful. Okay, couple of hands up. Let's take these questions. Yes, Prabhu has a question. Uh, what's the name here? Asim Krishna Prabhu. Yes, Asim Krishna Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj, please accept my obeisances. Uh, Maharaj, I was just thinking that why, why Indra is sitting with his wife on the throne, Sachi Devi, because he is in the... In, is he always sitting with the wife on the throne? Because I never saw a king sitting with his wife on the throne. Well, it's described like that, yes. That's the words of the Srimad Bhagavatam. That wife was also there. And just like Lord Rama would sit on the throne with his wife, and Lord Shiva is also there with his wife. Okay, okay, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. Yes, Maharaj, actually, I have a question, Maharaj. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, because uh, Maharaj Indra was bewildered because of his material opulence, what illuminated him to realize or to repent uh, that he had committed a blunder by offending his spiritual master? Because there is no situation or nothing is explained regarding his transformation. So, how can we understand what made him to? realize and to uh, bow down his head? Well, uh, he just saw that his spiritual master had gone. Initially, you know, the spiritual, Brihaspati came into the place and he saw everything and Indra was not doing anything. He didn't get up, he didn't offer respects or anything. So then Brihaspati left. So when Brihaspati left, then it seemed to bring Indra to his senses. And he realized, oh, I've committed an, a mistake. I should, have been, I should be more attentive. I should give proper respect to my spiritual teacher. And that's what happened. It brought Indra to his senses. But it was too late. Brihaspati had gone. Brihaspati understood what was going on. He understood that, that Indra has become proud, he's intoxicated, he's bewildered by all the opulence, and he's not offering any respect to his own guru. 
Now, how important is it to respect the Guru? What is the position of the spiritual master? What does the Shastra say? Spiritual master's instructions must be followed, he should give him respect. What kind of respect? As good as Lord. Yes, as good as the Lord. The spiritual master is honored as the Supreme Lord. Why? What does Guru Vastikam say? Shakshad Derek Vinasa Masta Shastre Uktas Tatabhav Yata Evas. The spiritual master is honored as the Supreme Lord. Why? Because someone? Why is the spiritual master honored? Nobody knows? Because he is the most dear servant of the Lord. Yes, because he is the most confidential servitor of the Lord. This is acknowledged in all revealed scriptures and is followed by all authorities. Therefore, I offer my respectful obeisances to the lotus feet of my spiritual master, who is a bona fide representative of Sri Hari Krishna. So, there, there are many other verses also where we un, were given importance to the position of the spiritual master. It, it, it's a fundamental principle of devotional service that you have to accept initiation from a spiritual master. We have to surrender to a spiritual master. And we have to see that spiritual master as a representative of God. As Srila Prabhupada would sometimes say, he said, uh, you know, when people were, uh, what, uh, what was happening? Or was that one devotee's mother came to see Srila Prabhupada and she attended the morning program and she saw Prabhupada's Guru Puja and everything. And later on, after the morning program, she got to meet Srila Prabhupada. And she said to Srila Prabhupada, she said, Oh, he said, she said, Swamiji, I, I see your disciples worship you. And Prabhupada looked at her and said, Yes, and I also worship my spiritual master. So that is an important point to remember. It's not just you worship the spiritual master and the spiritual master's God. But the spiritual master, he also thinks of himself as a servant of his spiritual master. And he also worships his spiritual master. So parampara system is there. Don't be envious of the spiritual master. Sometimes people are envious. So, oh, you're sitting on the big seat. No, right. Some, Sometimes people, uh, people would ask questions like that to Prabhupada. Why you have to sit on the big seat? We are all sitting on the floor. So Prabhupada would say, are you envious? <laughs> yeah, of course they are. They're envious. That's the fact. Don't be envious of the spiritual master. Try to understand, he is the confidential servitor of Krishna. He is accepting these things, not for his sense gratification, but to show the, the, how we should worship the spiritual master. To, to, to impress upon other people the importance of giving proper respect to the spiritual master. And Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was very very powerful in this matter and he gave a lot of importance to this making sure that people offered proper respect to understand the position of the spiritual master because without that you're not going to make spiritual and you may commit offenses and with offenses then your spiritual life is doomed So this is an important message here in this chapter. Okay, we'll take a break. Would you have 10 minute break usually or 5 minutes? 
Ten minutes. Huh? Ten minutes fast. Ten minutes, okay. Ten minute break. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes, can we continue? Yes, Maharaj. All right. So we're on this six six canto chapter seven, and we're up to text number fifteen. And we heard Indra describe his situation and regret his mistake in offending his spiritual master. So he was very anxious to find out his spiritual master. He wanted to show that he, he does need his spiritual master and he wanted to offer his respects to his spiritual master. So, text 16 describes how Indra, how he's repented, but Brihaspati is more powerful than Indra. Brihaspati is the spiritual master, he's more powerful, and he understood the mind of Indra. He understood that Indra will be regretting his mistake, and he'll be looking for me, and he'll be coming and want to offer his respects. And so Brihaspati decided that he would that he would just become invisible. And Brihaspati left his home and made himself invisible. So that Indra and the other demigods who were coming looking for him, they wouldn't be able to find him. So this is a plight which Indra put himself into. So text 17 describes how the demigods and Indra are searching, but they couldn't find Brihaspati. And Indra was thinking, oh, my spiritual master has become dissatisfied with me, and now I have no means of achieving good fortune. Although Indra was surrounded by demigods, he could not find peace of mind it's because he'd offended a, 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 his spiritual master, someone who was a very learned brahmana, very senior person in the universe, the, the guru of the demigods, and he's committed an offense against them. How could he have any good fortune? There would be no, nothing auspicious in his life. So this is the situation Indra is feeling very, finding it very difficult. Text 18 goes on, describes how the demons heard about the condition of the demigods. News travels, you see. <laughs> Even in the higher planets, from the higher planets down to the lower planets, the planets of the demons, they got news that Indra's in trouble and their guru has left him. And so the, the demons, they have their guru, Sukra Acharya, and they equipped themselves with weapons and they declared war against the demigods. So they took advantage of the situations. Sukracharya told them, he told them, now they don't have their guru, now is the time for you to go and fight them, and certainly you'll defeat them, because they don't have the blessings of their spiritual master. So they've lost their power. So there's nothing very auspicious for them. 
So the situation is very good for the demons that they can go there and take over the heavenly planets. And so it happened. This text 19 describes the plight of the demigods, their legs, their thighs, their arms, all the parts of their bodies were injured by the arrows of the, demi, of the demons. And the demigods headed by Indra, they saw no other course than to go to Lord Brahma with bowed heads for shelter and proper instruction. So we see the demigods, uh, when they're in difficulty, they go to Lord Brahma and they're asking Lord Brahma to help them. Just like 5,000 years ago, the earth, the earth planet was <coughs> excuse me. The earth, the earth planet was overburdened by demoniac kings. So Bhumi, Mother Earth, in the form of Bhumi, approached Lord Brahma for help. And, and then Lord Brahma prayed to uh, Shirodakashai Vishnu, and Lord Vishnu told Lord Brahma that I'm coming and you can all go and take birth in the Yadu dynasty and I will also come there. So similarly here, the demigods are going to Lord Brahma and they're asking Lord Brahma to help them. And Lord Brahma sees them coming before them, and he sees their situation, how their body's all injured. So he feels some compassion for them, and he's going to try to help them, but at the same time, he's going to point out the cause of their problem. So text number 21, Lord Brahma speaking, he said, O best of the demigods, unfortunately, because of madness resulting from your material opulence, you failed to receive Brihaspati properly when he came to your assembly. Because he is aware of the Supreme Brahman and fully in control of his senses, he is the best of the Brahmanas. Therefore, it is very astonishing that you have acted impudently towards him. So Lord Brahma is pointing out the defect of Indra and the, the other demigods. Again, Brahma is pointing out the problem because you are because of your material opulence, you've become mad. You did not give proper respect to such a great soul. He's, he knows the Supreme Brahman and he's in control of his senses. He's the best of the Brahmanas. Right? So he's described the qualities, the qualification of such a great personality. And if you disrespect them, then certainly then it's very, very bad for your spiritual life. So Lord Brahma, he could understand the qualifications of Brihaspati, and he was pointing out to these demigods how they had done a great offense. So in the purport, you can see I've marked some points. Lord Brahma wanted to impress upon the demigods that one's guru should not be disrespected under any circumstances. Oh, certainly, uh, we would always have a, like a festival when Srila Prabhupada would come. And we would always want to make the temple very nice. We'd try to paint the temple, fresh paint and doing things that we wanted the temple to look very good, Srila Prabhupada is coming. And spiritual masters, the representative of God, just as if Lord Krishna is coming. 
So the spiritual master is representative of Lord Krishna and we, we want to do everything to please him and make sure nice people are coming to the temple, make sure the devotees are all neat and clean, everyone's shaved their heads and all, they're all in nice cloth, all the ladies dressed in saris and their hairs tied and covered. And so some of the dangers which come, as I said, if you get too close, we become over familiar, but then that can cause a problem. As quoted here by Prabhupada, he says, familiarity breeds contempt. So Indra had become over familiar with Brihaspati and he did not give proper respects to his spiritual master. And Lord Brahma knows about this. Of course, Lord Brahma, he's also a spiritual master. So he knows the dangers, he knows the problems. Lord Brahma also has to be careful when he deals with Lord Krishna. And later on in the purport, Prabhupada writes, the demigods being puffed up by their by their material possessions were disrespectful to their guru. And Prabhupada quotes in the purport, Acharya mam vijaniyam navamam yeta karechit namurja budayasu yeta. The Acharya should always be offered respectful obeisances. One should never envy the Acharya, considering him an ordinary human being. So this is an, an important verse here, relevant verse from the scriptures, Acharya mam vijaniyam, you should know the Acharya as my very self. Yeah, Ramcharan Prabhu, you have your hand up, you have a question or a comment? Yes Maharaj, uh, I have a, if, if, can I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, Maharaj, I have a question uh, because here we see uh, Indra definitely offended his Guru, Brispati. Uh, but one thing that I was always curious is that uh, that Br uh, after that, Brispati disappeared and uh, Indra realized but he did not get chance to repent against his, uh, in front of his Guru. So, how do we understand that, like, if, if um, because as a conditioned soul, people can make mistake or they can disrespect. We should be very careful, definitely. But if they mistake, like, uh, is, uh, like, how Indra, like, uh, would have repented in front of his guru rather than he has to go through the suffering of, uh, of uh, disrespecting, disrespecting the guru? Yes, well... It, it probably wasn't the first time that this had happened, you know? Brihaspati, being the guru, he understands the mind of the disciple. The spiritual master knows the mind of the disciple and he knows how to treat the mind of the disciple. So in this case, Indra, his mind was polluted and Brihaspati knew he had to teach him a good lesson to bring him to his senses. If he just makes it too easy for him to get forgiven, then he won't learn the lesson. Okay, Maharaj. So sometimes it's necessarily like that, that we have to suffer in order to learn the lesson, not to do it again. Otherwise we think, oh, I can get away with it. I did it last time, you forgive me, you'll forgive me next time. And you don't take, oh, it's easy, I can get forgiven, he'll forgive me. And so, Brihaspati wants to teach the lesson, he wants to ta teach Indra that this is a serious thing, you make, you've made a serious offence. <coughs> so, let him suffer. And, you know, by that suffering, that the pain which he goes through will bring him to his senses. 
Thank you very much. All right, text number 22. Because of your misbehavior towards Brihaspati, Lord Brahma is speaking, Lord Brahma says to the demigods headed by Indra, because of your misbehavior towards Brihaspati, you have been defeated by the demons. My dear demigods, since the demons were weak, having been defeated by you several times, how else could you, who were so advanced in opulence, be defeated by them? So, <laughs> Lord Brahma is saying to them, you see, you see, you see what happened? You know, you defeated them so many times. How could they defeat you this time? Of course, the reason is because they didn't have the mercy of their guru. And the purport Prabhupada said, as stated in the Shastra, when one disrespects a, respect, a respectable superior, one loses his longevity and the results of his pious activities. And in this way, one is degraded. Do you believe it? Hmm? If you disrespect superiors, you reduce your jury, you lose your longevity, you lose your pious activities, and you become degraded. It's so serious. We have to be very careful dealing with the spiritual superiors, respected superiors. It's very, very cautious. So, Maharaj, here the respectable superiors means spiritual masters? Uh... Yes, spiritual superiors, not only spiritual masters, brahmanas, senior Vaishnavas, They were senior in uh, they are seniors in age. Can they be recognized as super, uh, superiors? Yes, superiors? people can also be superior in that sense. There are different ways people can be superior. Somebody's superior by initiation. Someone's su superior by age. Someone's superior by position of authority. Someone may be superior by realization. Suppose yes. Maharaj, in, in, in an official transaction, suppose I am discharging my responsibility and I am chastising a person who is uh, subordinate to me, uh, he is uh, seriously negligent, intentionally, um, he is very obsessive, he is not performing the responsibility properly, so if I will chastise him, that means that, that will amount to disrespect. Uh, can it be avoided or is there any solution so as to deal with the situation? Yes, it's not good for a spiritual life. Someone is disrespectful, they're not cooperative, they're not listening to someone in authority, then it's not good for them. If, if they're giving trouble like that, then you have to move them out. You have to give, put them in some other place. Don't have them come uh, work in, in so closely with you. Put them into some lower position. Take away their power, take away their authority. Because if they're not respecting the authority, if they're not respecting their authorities, then they don't deserve to have any position themselves. The spiritual master's qualification is he's the most expert in worshipping the Supreme Lord that he's an expert worshipper of the Lord. We shouldn't envy him. He's their spirit, spiritual masters teaching us how to worship the Lord, and we should follow. So someone else, if they cannot respect superiors, then they won't be able to worship the Lord properly either, because they don't know how to respect the, the devotees. And Krishna said, one who said he is my devotee, he's not my devotee. If he's not a devotee of my devotees, then he's not my devotee. 
You have to be a devotee of Krishna's devotees, then you can be a devotee of Krishna. Okay, we'll yes, go ahead, take, text 23. Oh Indra, your enemies, the demons, were extremely weak because of their disrespect towards Sukracharya. But since they have now worshipped Sukracharya with great devotion, they have again become powerful. By their devotion to Sukracharya, they have increased their strength so much that now they are even able to easily seize my abode from me. And so Prabhupada writes in the purport, Lord Brahma wanted to point out to the demigods that by the strength of the guru, one can become most powerful within the world. And by the displeasure of the guru, one can lose everything. And this is, this is what's happening here. The demigods have lost everything because they displeased their guru. So the power of the spiritual teacher is very, very important. There's this verse you often hear, maybe Jai Pataka Swami will recite it when he's giving class. It's from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Mukam karoti vacha lampan gam langayate girim yakripata maham bande paramanandan majanam Sri Chaitanya Iswaram Sri Gurun dinatarinam. Right? By the Sri Gurun dinatarinam. By the mercy of the spiritual master, a lame man can cross mountains, a blind man can see the stars, a dumb man can recite poetry. It's all possible by the mercy of the spiritual master. But without the mercy of the spiritual master, then we'll just be havoc, just be problems in the path of spiritual life. Text 24, because of their firm determination, in other words, the demons, their firm determination to follow the instructions of Sukracharya, his disciples, the demons, are now unconcerned about the demigods. In fact, kings or others who have, who have determined faith in the mercy of brahmanas, cows, and the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, and who always worship these three, are always strong in their position. Very interesting verse, important point to note that people who have determined faith in the mercy of the brahmanas, the cows and the Supreme Lord, then they will always be strong in their position. So Lord Krishna of course is very dear to the cows and the brahmanas. And Brihaspati is a Brahmana, and Indra had not properly received him, had not properly respected him when he came into the assembly. So Indra was guilty, the demigods were all guilty, they were all involved. They didn't, they didn't give proper respect to the Brahmanas, and so they lost all of their opulence. In the purport, Prabhupada said, at the present moment all over the world, governments have no respect for brahmanas, cows and govinda. And consequently, there are chaotic conditions all over the world. The brahmanas, cows and govinda, the Supreme Lord. So, we must remember these things, give proper respect to the, the Brahmana. Of course, Brahmana, we don't just mean only simply Brahmana by birth, but we mean people who are actually working like Brahmanas, who do the work of the Brahmanas and who have the qualities of the Brahmanas. That is the real Brahmana. 
Not just simply, oh, I'm Brahmana. My father's a Brahmana. I'm a Brahmana. We want, Brahmana must work like the Brahmana. Yajan Yajan, Patan Patan, Dan Patigraha. This is the work of the Brahmana. He can teach the scriptures and he can study the scriptures. He can worship the deities and he can teach people to worship the deities and he can give charity and he can accept charity. But Kali Yuga Brahmanas, they only do want, they only, they want the charity. The other things they don't care about. This is Kali Yuga. So, we have to learn, we have to remember these things. Take care of the cows, take care of the brahmanas, and worship the Supreme Lord. So, Brahm, Lord Brahma is giving instructions to the demigods, and he tells them, I, I instruct you to approach Vishwarup, the son of Twashta, and accept him as your guru. He is a pure and very powerful brahmana undergoing austerity and penances. Please, by your worship, he will fulfill your desires, provided that you tolerate his being inclined to side with the demons. <laughs> now, why, why would he side with the demons? Because the mother is from the side of the demons. The mother was from the family of the demons. And therefore, Twashta feels some, uh, rather Vishwarup feels some affection for the demons. And that leads to Indra killing him. Anyway, we'll hear about this as it goes on. But anyway, Lord Brahma had advised, had advised the demigods, you, you have to be tolerant, that he's an austere, he's renounced, but he has some affection for the demons. So Lord Brahma helped to relieve the anxiety of the demigods, and the demigods, they all went to see Vishwarup, and they approached Vishwarup, and they embraced him, and they spoke very nicely to him. Right? So text 27 describes how the demigods approached Vishwarup and they said, Oh, beloved Vishwarup, may there be all good fortune for you. We the demigods have come to your ashram as your guests. Please try to fulfill our desire according to the time, since we are on the level of your parents. We are on the level of your parents. In other words, well, they're demigods. And, and so they're on the same level as, the, as Twashta, the father of Vishwarup. And tw text 28, O Brahmana, the highest duty of a son, even though he has sons of his own, is to serve his parents. And what to speak of a son who is a brahmachari. <laughs> oh, Vishwarup was a brahmachari. Huh? So the demigods are saying, we are your parents, we're like your parents, you should, wish, you should do what we want, please us. All right. Text 29 and 30, the acharya, the spiritual master who teaches all the Vedic knowledge and gives initiation by offering the sacred thread is the personification of all the Vedas. Similarly, a father personifies Lord Brahma, a brother, King Indra, a mother, the planet Earth, and a sister, Mercy, a guest, personifies religious principles. An invited guest personifies the demigod Agni, and all living entities personify Lord Vishnu, 
the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So, <laughs> the demigods are speaking like this, they want to encourage Vishwarup to do what they want. <clears throat> Prabhupada writes in the purple, he said, this verse describes the different ways in which one should respect a guru, a father, a brother, a sister, a guest, and so on. How to respect different people. Right? The Kali Yuga, of course, we don't know these things. Text 31. Dear son, we have been defeated by our enemies, meaning the demons. And therefore, we are very much, of course, they don't mention who their enemies are, because the demons are actually, the demons are the friends of Vishwarup. But they just say, we've been defeated by our enemies. Please mercifully fulfill our desires by relieving our distress through the strength of your austerities. Please fulfill our prayers. In other words, the demigods, they want Vishwarup to be their guru and to help them for their battle. Text 32, the, the demigods are speaking why they want Vishwarup to do this. They say, you're aware of the Supreme Brahman. You're a perfect Brahmana. And you are the spiritual master of all orders of life. We accept you as our spiritual master and director so that by the power of your austerity we may easily defeat the enemies who have conquered us. So, spiritual teachers, we say, well, this is not really a, it's a guru, but it's, they, they, they have something. The demigods just simply want to win the battle. They want to get back their kingdom. So Prabhupada said, one must approach a particular type of guru to execute a particular type of duty. Although Vishwarup was inferior to the demigods, the demigods accepted him as their guru so they could conquer the, the demons. So they wanted the help of Vishwarup just, so, just for this purpose, not for spiritual advancement, but just to conquer the demons. And then the, the demigods want to encourage Vishwarup because they're senior, so that they're senior in age. They were saying, we're like your parents. So they said, but don't worry, you can still be our guru. Even though you're younger than us, you can still be your guru. Because they said, this, that etiquette doesn't apply in the Vedic mantras. The, the, and the demigods say, except in relationship to Vedic mantras, seniority is determined that by age. But what they want from Vishwarup, they want him to be the guru in the Vedic mantras. So it's not nothing to do with age. One may offer respectful obeisances even to a younger person who is advanced in chanting Vedic mantras. Therefore, although you are junior in relationship to us, you may become our priest without hesitation. So we see like that, we get sometimes the young boys from the Guru Kula, they will come and they chant the Vedic mantras so nicely. They're just young boys, but they're, they're very good in chanting the Vedic mantras. They do them every day, they chant every day. So they're very familiar with how to chant the Vedic mantras. So they're acting like spiritual t teachers. In the purport, I've highlighted this one section. The brahmanas, the members of the most elevated varna, are teachers. But a person in a lower family, such as a family of Kshatriya, Vaishya, or even Sudras, 
may be accepted as a teacher if he has knowledge. Of course, this, this point comes up in Lord Chaitanya's discussion with Ramananda Rai, because Ramananda Rai was born in a Sudra family and he was a Grihastha. So when he met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Ramananda Rai said, you know, it's not proper that I'm answering your questions, but you're the sannyasi. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was a sannyasi and he was born in the Brahmana family. He said, I should be asking you questions. Ramananda Rai said, it's my duty to question you. But Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, no, no. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said this verse, which is quoted in the purpur here, which is from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Kiba Vipra Kiba Nasi Shudra Kininai, Ye Krishna Tadva Vetse Guru Hai. That you can become the Guru if you know Krishna Tadva. It doesn't matter if you're a Vipra, meaning a Brahmana, or a Nyasi, a renunciate, or a Sudra, whatever position you're in. That's not important. What is important is that you know Krishna Tattva, then you can become the spiritual teacher. So Ramananda Rai certainly knew Krishna Tattva and Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was very happy to put questions to him. So Vishwarup is very happy to have the demigods all come and petition him in this way. And he responds to them, text 35, he said, How can someone like me refuse to accept your personal request? You are all exalted commanders of the universe. I am your disciple and must take many lessons from you. Therefore, I cannot refuse you. I must agree for my own benefit. So it's the duty of the Brahmana to try to serve society. And the purport Prabhupada says, that's the words of the pious acts previously performed by the priest or spiritual master are diminished. Therefore, priesthood is not accepted by learned Brahmanas. Nevertheless, the greatly learned Brahmana Vishwarup became the priest of the demigods because of the profound respect for them. So Prabhupada was explaining, to become the priest, you have to accept the karma of the people. Right. If you accept the post of spiritual master, then it neutralizes the sinful reactions of the person. But the one who's doing the yagya, he gets some of the karma. The priest takes the karma for the people who he does the yagya for. So people don't like, that's why people, some often they won't like to do the yagya, because they know they're taking some of the karma. All right, text 36. O exalted governors of var various planets. And he talking about the duty of a Brahmana, how they should pick up grains from the field, how they should live. A Brahmana who desires to achieve happiness by gaining wealth, through professional priesthood, must certainly have a very low mind. How shall I accept such priesthood? So, Vishwarupa is making the point that if one simply does the duty of priesthood or becomes a guru just to get material benefit, then it's very low. It's very, very bad for a person. Sometimes people 
just simply give initiation, they just accept disciples just simply taking to get the material wealth, to get some money from people. So a guru should never demand anything from his disciples to live in opulence, imitating kshatriyas or vaishyas. In other words, a pure brahmana voluntarily accepts a life of poverty and lives in complete dependence on the mercy of the Lord. And Prabhupada writes about it, he describes about not many years ago how there was this one guru living in Navadweep and he was just living on some, some tamarind leaves which he grew. And the disciples would come, they wanted to buy all kinds of nice vegetables and give him. They said, no, 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 I'm happy, I just want to eat what I grow here. He would not take any wealth from the disciples. So the condition is that although a brahmana may receive much opulence from his disciples, he should not utilize the rewards of this priesthood for his personal benefit. He must use them for the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. This is a very important point and we try to enforce this point in ISKCON also. All the spiritual teachers in ISKCON, they have to give reports every year about how much donations they have received and where they use it, how they use it. And they have to give a report about how much money they keep in the bank and how much opulence they have, how many computers they have, how many mobile phones and things like that. Are they spending money like that? And so, we, in this way, they try to keep a check on these things, try to keep the spiritual masters, the devotees, keep them living simply. Whatever wealth we, we received, it's not for the guru, it's not for their pocket, it's for ISKCON, it belongs to ISKCON. Whatever monies, whatever donations, are, it's not for their purpose, it's all for the service of the society. So Prabhupada is making that point. So Vishwarup is saying that, okay, I will accept the duty, I will become your priest, I shall do what you want. So after promising like that to the demigods, Vishwarupa started to do the, the, the different activities with great, with great enthusiasm and attention. And Prabhupada writes in the purport that a priest, a priest's first, first duty is to see that his disciples benefit spiritually and materially by all means. Then he is satisfied. A priest should never be interested in performing Vedic rituals for his personal benefit. Right? So important instructions are given here about how a person should live. Okay, we just finish this chapter here, text 39. So because Vishwarup was very powerful, he composed a mantra, a prayer called the Narayana Kavacha. And that's the next chapter. Next chapter we'll hear tomorrow about the Narayana Kavacha. So by this intelligent mantra he took away the opulence of the demons and gave it to Mahindra, the king of heaven. And then finally Vishwarup, who was most liberal, spoke to Indra, the secret hymn that protected Indra and conquered the military power of the demons. So in this way we finish this chapter entitled Indra Offends the Spiritual Master Brihaspati. Are there any questions?
Any comments? Okay, thank you very much. Hare Krishna.